Welcome, everybody. Um, I hope you're enjoying a good lunch. Is it good? Yep, yep. good to hear. Um, so welcome at the Ignite Sessions at JFL. Um, for those of you who don't know the format yet, um, we're going to hold lightning talks, five minutes, um, 15 seconds per slide, 20 slides in total. Um, that means a lot of pressure on our uh, speakers. So I'd like to uh, start off with a great applause for the guys who will be standing here. Um, well, my name is Jeroen, this is Mark, we'll be your host today, so we'll just be announcing the speakers. We're not the speakers themselves, unless somebody uh, decides not to show up, then we'll be doing the lighting talk ourselves, <laughs> we think. Um, it will be great, it'll be fun, either for us or for the speakers, uh, or both, we hope. Um, and without further ado, um, Mark will introduce us to the first speaker. Okay, I would like to ask to the stage uh, Sander Koopmans, he's going to talk about unit tests. Thank you. Okay. Ready? Yeah, I'm Five, ready. Four, three, two, one, go. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark and Jeroen. In the coming five minutes, I will explain how you can write unit tests without mocks using test data builders. And as an example uh, application, I use a completely fictitious app that allows clients to book hotel rooms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this application has a layered architecture, as you can see on the left-hand side. If you want to test the booking service, you have to replace the reservation though by a mock, right? Well, I like to use the reservation though in my test and to replace the database by an in-memory database like H2. Each test case starts with a fresh database. Never share databases with multiple tests. But tests for more than one class cannot be unit tests. Well, Ian Cooper explains that tests must be written for requirements, not per class or per method. So I want to test this requirement. Given that Alice books the last available room of a hotel, when Bob books the, a room in the same hotel, then he's notified that the room is no longer available. So each test starts with an empty database. So each test must store data in a database. Well, you can use XML files for this, or JSON files, or SQL files, but don't do that. This is a complete unit test for the requirements using test data builders. The methods Alice, Bob, and Single Room Hotel each create objects with realistic data and store them in a database. So what does a test data builder look like? Well, it looks like a builder class. And like a builder class, it has a build method that builds the object in memory. But now come the differences. I add a method, build and save, which builds the object in memory and saves it in the database. The client now is production code, so no mocks. And the big difference with a normal builder class is that the test data builder starts with all fields filled with realistic data. This way, each test only needs to specify values that are relevant to the test. And most tests need one or two clients, so I add convenience methods for Alice and Bob. And thanks to the get or create behavior, you can call Alice and Bob as often as you want, creating no more than one Alice and no more than one Bob. And here is a test data builder for hotels. And most tests need at most one or two hotels. So we add convenience methods for hotels too. This convenience method gets or creates a, a hotel with a single room. Mm -hmm. 
So here's the test again. Now imagine we add a new field. For instance, uh, we add a rating to the hotel class. The existing tests don't need to be changed. Only the test data builder for hotels needs to fill in a default value for the new field. Great, isn't it? And thanks to the gather create behavior, there's no need to use variables. We can save a couple of lines by inlining them. And if you're not afraid of static imports, you can make the test even shorter. It's up to you if you like it. And how do you actually curate the tables in an anti database for each test? Well, you can write SQL files yourself, or you can use a an ORM like Hibernate, or use a library like Liquibase. So in the past five minutes, I explained how you can use write unit tests without mocks. Use test data builders to store data in an in-memory database for readable and maintainable tests. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sander. Um, well, now we're up for the next presentation. Um, great talk, at least, on, on how to not use mocks. Um, if the, the presenter we're missing is not showing up, we will have to mark a presentation, so we're kind of raising on tension over here. Um, next presentation, we will have to manage that knowledge, um, and that is something that David Stibbe knows a lot about and will introduce you <laughs> to. <laughs> thank morning. you very much. <coughs> All right. Hi, uh, my name is David Stibbe, and I'm a Java developer, and I'll give a too short introduction into knowledge management. <coughs> so, uh, one and a half years ago, so still ago, <coughs> I made a cosmic mistake regarding uh, actually losing some knowledge, and I came to the conclusion that knowledge is actually just as valuable as time and money. Since it costs time and money to create knowledge and losing it, well, you will need to spend it again. <coughs> so then I started doing some research and discovered there's a whole area uh, dedicated to this called personal knowledge management, PKM for short. So this is uh, Nicholas Luhmann. He's a German so sociologist. And he was pr very prolific. He created like 600 pap papers uh, till he died. And he was able to do this by managing his knowledge with a personally created knowledge management system, which was actually a bunch of uh, cabinet full of index cards which referenced each other. And <coughs> by doing this, he actually created hyperlinks on paper and was capable of finding any knowledge he wanted. Luckily, we're living in 2022. And we don't need to use cabinets of index cards, and we can just use a computer, a laptop, and all software in the world. So my poison of choice is called Obsidian. It's a text editor just like Visual Studio Code, but it has an extra benefit because it's also a local wiki. <coughs> so. The, this is an example screen, so you see some benefits of uh, Obsidian. On the right-hand side, you'll see a list of tags that you can reference. You can reference notes internally. You can reference links externally. And you write everything in Markdown. To create a note, a uh, link to another note, you just type the title of note and close it in square brackets. And you have a reference to another note. If it doesn't exist, you can just create one with a sh simple shortcut. So it also provides this very cool view of all nodes and the relations that they have. How, yeah, sometimes it's useful and it can show you where there might be a code smell, so to say, and where you should pay attention because some nodes might not have relations. <coughs> but having software alone is not enough because you would have all your nodes in one directory and it would still be chaotic. So therefore, you need structure. And there's this guy called Viago Forte, who introduced a terminology called PARA, which is projects, areas, resources, and archives. And I'll explain two terms, projects and resources, because my time is too limited. <coughs> so projects. I have a whole bunch of them, because I'm a Java developer in my free time as well. And each time I pick up an old project, 
I have to spend a lot of time finding out where I left off. <coughs> so I decide every time I start a project, I start with three notes. One describing the project goal and uh, <coughs> time span. The other log describing what I did, when I did it. And the other is my technical notes describing what technical hurdles I came across and solved. <coughs> so, and there's this resources. So there's just important as wood for a boat. You need resources to do a project or any other thing. And I categorize resources into three categories. Media, which is basically uh, JPEGs, PDFs like uh, manuals. Your notes, the things that you've learned, like if some, you read a book and they share your takeaways. And wiki, just a collection of facts, just like uh, grass is green stuff growing from the ground. So now we have structure and we have software, but we're still not done. Because creating a note, uh, you don't always have the time to do it perfect, and you want to have them clean and proper. So you need processes. And a simple process to implement is the inbox. So place every note that you create into an inbox, and once a week, twi twice, two weeks, you clean them up. You make sure that they're irreducible, make sure the tags are correct, make sure they're actually uh, useful. So having the system in place, well, <coughs> actually gave me quite a bit of control over my own knowledge and made me <laughs> lose a lot of let less knowledge. And for yourself, if you get home, I would ask you to take a look at that shit pile of notes that you have in your computer and try to clean them up with your own knowledge management system. And here's some links that you can follow to uh, get some inspiration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Guus, and he's going to tell, tell us all about Rubik's Cubes. Can we have the second mic? Okay. Let me let me help you. Uh, die weg dan hier en dan kan je hem dan even één keer klikken. Klik once. Nee nee gewoon één keer klikken want dan dan werkt hij. Even terug. Dan uh, dit zo. Dan die. Dan kunnen we die nog doen. En dan heb je hem daar ook. En dan kan je hier. Oh, dan moet je hier nog een keer klikken ja. Dat gaat even ja. Oké, okay, ready? I'm ready. Ja. Yeah. Three, two, one. All right, okay, so I have five minutes to talk to you about Rubik's Cubes, about how to solve them, and about how that makes you a better software developer. Also try to solve one in the end. Um, so one thing that both software development and cubing have in common is that they are hard problems. And the first thing that you want to do when you have a hard problem is split them into sub-problems. So that's what we do here with a cube, split them in several layers. If you can solve each, the whole will be the cube. And in software development, think of these as your features. Okay. So in cubing, I want to zoom in in one of these uh, problems. That's the first one. We want to put this small piece into the top. Um, so how do you do that? In software development, we use code. In cubing, we use something that's called an algorithm. So an algorithm is basically a sequence of moves that does something that you want. So in this case, it would be like turn the front side, then the downside, then the front side back. And that will specifically solve this case. It will put a small piece to the top. Um, it will do that in a moment, actually, so you can see it. And um, so you might ask, so how do you come up with these uh, algorithms? I mean, this one is only uh, three moves, uh, but it can become longer and harder, and you need to memorize them. Uh, but you don't have to do all of that yourself. The easy answer is you can just Google for it. So that's the same that we do with software development. It's perfectly valid. You can just Google it. They will tell you the answer, but it's only the first step. You can't just read a guide and then say, oh, I can solve a Rubik's Cube. No, you really have to do it, otherwise, what's the point? And we have to do the same with coding. You really have to practice, you have to get the, uh, the muscle memory down, you want to do katas, you want to do pet projects, and only then, after you did all of that, then you want to go to production. So, um, and in uh, going to production uh, with work, that means that you start programming and earn money. With cubing, what you can do is go to competition and earn lots of street creds. Um, but it might be a step too far when you're just starting out. So it's an easier way to actually start using it right now. And that's by using a Rubik's Cube as a tool to take more breaks from coding. Coding can be exhausting, um, and cubing can be a way to get some mental energy back. Um, it's really relaxing, you can do it anywhere, doesn't involve any screens. Great way to take a break. Uh, cool, I want to come back to something I said in the beginning, where we said, oh, if you have these sub-problems and you solve all of them, you have the whole thing. Well, 
in practice, it's not always quite that easy, um, as we also you know in software development, the requirements here are not independent. Because if you have the first thing, you want to go to the second, and you want to keep what you already had. And then you want to go to the last step and finish everything. And even if you know what you're doing, making only one small mistake, one move wrong, and you might end up with something that you did not predict, like something like this, where you actually did solve the last part, but you messed up everything that you already had. So uh, with a cube, they will, it will tell you, oh, I did something wrong. Um, this is not uh, what you wanted. Uh, in software development, we also have something uh, like that. That's what we call a test, or specifically a failing test. Um, in Cube, when you get it for free, you automatically see, oh, hey, I made a mistake. This is not correct. In um, pro software development, it's not always that clear. So make sure to write your test. If you don't do it, you won't notice any mistakes. And even better is if you write your tests first, and then your code. My colleagues will be annoyed that I tricked them in yet another TDD talk. But at least now they have the option. You can either do TDD, or you can learn how to solve a cube, and then you want to do TDD. So at least there's that, right? Um, OK, so to sum up what we already have, I told you five ways in which cubing can make you a better software developer. Uh, it's mostly about mindset, uh, about learning new things, about practicing. That's all you do with cubing, and you want to do the same in software development. Um, but uh, we only have five slides left. Um, so I also wanted to talk to you about uh, downsides that cubing might have. Um, because it's really fun, it can be relaxing, uh, but there are some things that you need to take into mind. Um, because uh, if you are prone, this is, so the first one's a bit serious, if you are prone to RSI issues or hand strains or something like that, uh, this might not be for you. Uh, it is quite stressful on your hands and fingers, I know that from experience. But um, even worse is if you are like me and you start something new, you start a new hobby and you really get addicted, uh, you want to have them all. Um, then you have to be uh, really careful because once you start, you won't stop. I had that when preparing for this talk. It was really hard to keep focused and not doing the cube. Um, so take that into mind as well. Lastly, uh, it's also a bit noisy. You might not hear it from there, but um, my parents would have paid good money if they could have had a quiet one of these. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't have it. So if you are going to the office, um, take that into mind for your colleagues as well. Uh, but we only have uh, one slide left. So let's see if we can do it, actually. No pressure, right? It's really relaxing. <laughs> Got it! <Yeah>. Why? <laughs> <laughs> right, thanks. <laughs> okay, awesome. I, w I was when I was reviewing your slides, I was still hoping you were going to do that on live on stage. Awesome job. Next up is Bart. Uh, Bart will talk about the big from big business to scale up. Ready for it? Good. Oh, yep. Let's get now. ready. Three, two, one. Let's go. Hello, everyone. I have a hearing disability, so my speech might sound a bit, a bit different. Uh, I'm going to talk about my uh, job fit from a big business to scale up. I was always wondering how it's like to work for scale up, and I want to share that with everyone here. Uh, I used to work for the Port of Rotterdam. Uh, it's one of the largest ports in the world. By some definition, the largest port in the world. And currently, I'm working for Maki, uh, Scale-Up. I hope everyone here knows the Port of Rotterdam. Uh, it's a very big business. Um, I was working there on a management information system that was used by the harbor masters to uh, tell when ships can enter and leave the Port of Rotterdam. Uh, currently, I'm working for Maki. Uh, the scale-up that tries to fix the labor market, also make work work again. So they do everything related to job, from uh, payment, pay slip, vacancies, to make sure uh, everyone can just join the platform and start working. <coughs> of course, there's a big world of difference between a new company and a company that has been existing for years. So you notice, especially for doing lunch, uh, the port of Rotterdam, you just sit with your own team or your own department, and you don't know anybody else there. I don't know but nobody from marketing, for example. Uh, at Maki, we all have lunch at the same time. It's a smaller company, you know everyone. Uh, I just jump back with the CEO, and you can discuss actual big with him. I think he knows the database model and all the tables better than uh, most of the developers. So that was really fun uh, at, uh, to notice. Another difference is that the application of the port of Rotterdam is used 24-7 to maintain that the uh, chips are always entering and leaving. So this also comes with uh, extra processes and policies. 
for example, uh, regarding database access. Um, <coughs> having read access was already quite hard. We're changing stuff is uh, generally uh, not done. Maybe I've done it one or twice, and then you have to discuss it with everyone before you do stuff like that. Uh, at Maki, we uh, use database access a lot more. Um, we have features that are not, yeah. For example, changing the start date of a contract. In the app, it's only possible to start your contract from today. But legally, it's possible to start a contract in the past. But if we change, allow companies to do that, they can, uh, if someone has a work accident, they can start the contract in the past. So we want to do some manual verification before we allow someone to start the contract in the past. Um, but we, but we do support it uh, this way. Of course, at, uh, at a technical depth, at the application that has been running for years, so to have technical depth is normal, ideas about software change. But in a younger company, I think, uh, I know it is also uh, a lot of tech depth. I think it's just part of the, of the job description to complain about uh, uh, code uh, previous developers have written. And it's a good thing, I think, it is, uh, a good thing to keep improving your software as long as there's well in balance between writing features and uh, supporting. In all the applications, there are a lot of uh, features. We don't know anymore how they work, how they work to post work away. way. Uh, nobody knows anymore. They were written 10 years ago. Um, uh, you have to redefine those features with your product owner. At Maki, we also uh, occur this kind of situation. A lot of the features were written uh, four, five years ago by only three people, and they have developed a lot over the years. So. Uh, we also have to discuss with the product owner, A, is this correct or not? One of the most annoying things, I think, are hardware issues. The part of water damage is really hard to get access there, and if something only occurs okay, there, it's really troublesome. You have to discuss with IT department that manage all uh, settings on those computers. At Maki, we uh, have this too, but mostly with mobile phones. Um, sometimes not even software related. They have, do not have a page on the phone and they want to download a file. And they got an error, but they will still call us and say it does not work. Uh, a major difference between the two, it's not really related to big business or scale up, is that the port of Rotterdam application there is used by the Harbour Masters only, and the application of Maki can be used by anyone. So if something does not work at the port of Rotterdam, they can just ask the caller from, hey, how do I do this? But at Maki, they will call our support team if they don't understand the feature, and then we uh, have to help them. But uh, <coughs> most of my work has remained the same. I Google some error messages, I drink some coffee, have some meetings, uh, have another meeting, be happy with the different error messages. Some prediction issue comes along. Uh, I get a warning instead of error so I can uh, go on with my, my, my work. So I think uh, most of the work does not really change, but the culture and, and the people around it uh, can really um, make your job a lot funner. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, up next, Jorik. He will talk about somebody named Jason Keys. I have no clue who that guy is. Probably some developer. Um, but I'm sure we'll, you'll tell us all about him. So hello everyone, I'm uh, Jorik Kleinsma. I'm a front-end developer at Ordina. Um, I'm going to talk about how to have a conversation with non-technical stakeholders about technical subjects or concepts. So I work at a project where we use a lot of JSON keys um, in, the, in the web application and a client asked during the meeting, who is JSON keys and why do I never see him in the meetings? <laughs> so, um, in the other meeting, I was with a, a colleague and he told uh, about a movie he saw where a man's wife was brutally murdered, his son was left disabled and kidnapped. Uh, sounds familiar? Uh, it's Finding Nemo. So um, <laughs> things can get complicated. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to show you some do's and some don'ts. And after every, every do and don't, I have an example of that do or don't. Um, there are different stages of the uh, contacts you have with the 
uh, stakeholders. It's before the contact, during the contact, and after the contact. There are some generic uh, stuff that goes across all those uh, stages, but the focus can be different per stage. So when the energy is focused on the concept, then uh, that is the, the reason why you focus on that stage, on that part I will mention uh, at, in the slides. So the first uh, stage is focusing on the result. Show what you're gonna achieve and not what you're going to do. Um, the client wants to have a visual representation of that or some kind of um, an knowledge about what he's gonna get. So this is an example of a visual uh, transformation from what's going to be happen. It can also be some kind of graph uh, where you show what the data is different or what the outcome is different or some text explanation uh, which helps the client to, to understand. Don't overwhelm them. Um, keep it simple and essential. Don't get all things included about what you want to tell them. Um, so we are all very passionate about what the techno concepts are but you aren't a teacher, you are giving a lecture to your stakeholders, so keep it relatively simple and only have the essential part. So get rid of all the noise that's cluttering your message. It can really help to use a metaphor that's on day-to-day -day basis, some tangible metaphor uh, which help the uh, stakeholder visualize themselves what the metaphor is, and then it can be, be better understood. Here is an explanation of semantic versioning, where you see on the first image a major uh, version with the electric uh, upgrade, then a basket upgrade, which is a minor version, and a patch, which would be a flat tire, <laughs> which would be literally uh, patched. Um, how would you like it to uh, have it explained to yourself? If you can imagine how it, uh, if you don't know it yourself, how, um, how would you want it to be, to be presented? and learn from the people uh, you have the conversation with. Because when you get to know them, you can level at their, um, you can level with them and use a metaphor, for example, which helps them. So understand the people that uh, you have the conversation with. Take those learnings and document them, repeat what, what, what worked, so the next time you have a next meeting with them, you know on forehand what you can do, so this comes after the contact, and turn those learnings into actions. So write them down uh, so you know the next time what, you, what did work or what didn't work. Um, so the, um, so if, if, you, if you have those um, uh, stuff mentioned, don't take over the wheel. Let them do their jobs, because um, if you have too difficult to explain and then say, oh, you, let's do it myself, then do it once and you do it always because they're never gonna learn. So assist them and make them comfortable uh, for asking uh, stuff about the th th things you tell and be there for support. So get them really comfortable so they can uh, collaborate with you. Um, so to wrap up, stay in your lane, what's essential, use a good metaphor and um, pretend like uh, you don't know the stuff, and now would you have known it yourself? Document, adjust, repeat, and learn, and let them do it themselves. So for the next encounter, think twice when you say, "We will need going. Uh, we will going to need that delivered in camel case." <laughs> so thank you for listening and attending. Um, have a nice day. Uh, thanks. Very nice. When I was reviewing the presentation, I was really wondering about what this was going to be, but awesome. Uh, next up is Laurens, I think, um, about Kotlin, about serverless, about a lot of buzzwords in five minutes. Two seconds. Two seconds. Oh, four. No pressure. <laughs> Three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Today I will be talking about Kotlis. And Kotlis stands for Kotlin Serverless Framework. It's a project by JetBrains and it's still in the incubator phase, which means that it's still experimental and maybe not uh, ready for production use yet. 
Um, I always like to, uh, to learn something when at home, and in this case, I really wanted to learn about both Kotlin and serverless. Only my time is limited, having some young children, so uh, yeah, I needed something quick, and therefore I ended up with, uh, with Kotlin. Once I'm uh, doing a, a private project, I always like to work on a use case as well, right? You need to define a goal, as we learned in the keynote uh, this morning. So sometimes I have the problem that I forget to pack my umbrella when it's going to rain, and I'm definitely going to solve that with uh, both Kotlin and serverless. So here's my user story. Given that I check my email when I wake up, when it will rain, then please let me know via email. So I want to trigger some Lambda function, serverless function. I connect to a weather cloud service, by radar in this instance. And if it's going to rain, then please uh, send me an email. So let's uh, take on the challenge and uh, generate this application uh, together in these uh, four left minutes. So uh, I choose uh, Gradle as a build system and uh, Kotlin as a language, and I use JDK 11 as well in IntelliJ. And once I hit the button, it will generate this nice boilerplate uh, project for me. So in the top, you see the latest Kotlin version is used, some dependencies and repositories are defined, and it, uh, it will even come up with, uh, with a Hello World uh, application itself. So you see that over here. And of course, I can run this using IntelliJ, and it will uh, yeah, run perfectly. Uh, so now we have a working application, right? And we can, uh, can throw all the Kotlin uh, stuff at it. So you see me uh, doing that uh, here. So in the top, you see that I defined the Kotlin plugin. Also do know that I needed to downgrade the Kotlin version for this, unfortunately. And in the bottom, you see that I add some dependencies as well. So I'm using the Kotlin Lang AWS here. There's one for Azure as well. I have no mileage on that. Uh, those uh, plugins and uh, dependencies are not in Maven Central, so I also needed to point to the JetBrains Maven repository to, uh, yeah, to download it from the internet and, uh, and get it working. <coughs> now uh, let's go ahead and make application. You see me doing that here. So I define a get annotation. I go to the root, uh, it returns on string. I can run the Kotlin's uh, local task, as you see on the right, and I have my first uh, web application running. But of course, I want to deploy this uh, in the cloud as a service, serverless, um, and you see me doing that here. So I need a bit of additional configuration. On the bottom, you, you see me pointing to where, which package to search for, uh, for the application itself. And you see me also uh, doing some AWS-specific uh, stuff. So I point to a S3 bucket. This is basically where to store the, the code. And using a profile, which is linked to a user, I, I give some users some rights to uh, actually go ahead and uh, deploy it. Well, now I'm all set, so I can uh, start the deploy task in the, of the Kotlin plugin. A whole lot of stuff is happening, and in the end you see a URL here. And then when I open it up, it actually goes to my Lambda function, and I have my first serverless function running. Um, well, next thing is that I need to connect to Bioradar, so I use the Java 11 HTTP client to do so. And using Kotlin X, the serialization, I serialize the response back into data classes. <clears throat> now, well, on to my business logic. I get uh, the forecast for tomorrow, and if the rain chance is more than 20%, then I create a beautiful uh, HTML page. I'm using uh, kotlinx.html for this. Gives you a nice DSL. This is uh, simple and elegant, as we learned this morning as well. Uh, last thing, um, I need to send an email, so I define an email service uh, or a class. I use Jakarta Mail for this, and using AWS SMS, which is simple notification service. I'm really able to send an email. So I put it two together. So uh, if it's not nil, I send an email. I still need to trigger it via a URL. You see that in the, in the top, and at uh, the right, you see the, the email I, I get. But obviously, I don't want to go ahead and uh, type in some URL each time. Well, fortunately, Kotlin has uh, something for that as well. So there's a scheduled annotation, and I have a cron job which runs uh, well daily, just before midnight or an hour earlier, depending on uh, the daylight uh, savings time. I promised it all to do it for free in the, the abstract, and it is free. So AWS Lambda has one million free requests per month, and also a thousand email deliveries are uh, more than enough for my use case. <laughs> So I would say, do try this at home. It's a lot of fun. I learned a lot, but maybe not at work. Uh, the latest release of Kotlin was more than a year ago. The latest closed issue was more than a year ago. And also, it doesn't work with the latest uh, Kotlin versions. So that's uh, very unfortunate.
Ah, well, I'm so glad you <laughs> showed up, or else we would have to do the presentation. <laughs> We're so you glad. Can, uh, you can join me. <laughs> you can join you. <laughs> We're just winging. No, no, no. We'll, we'll, we'll add you. We'll add you. <laughs> we wanted to improvise if you weren't here. <laughs> the art of blocking. Yes, the art of blogging. Uh, have fun. Hello. <laughs> oh, thank you. Hi, hello everyone. My name is Beppe. I work for Adyen as a developer advocate. Today I want to talk about two things. How cool it is to write blog posts and how difficult it is. And now you can get into a situation where your language is not really up with anymore. Well, like uh, she the both says, do it. You can have uh, several motivations. I like to do it because it's where I go deep into a topic, so it's a learning opportunity. But there are various other reasons. If you find your motivation, it gets a lot easier. Easy, no, when you try, you try, nothing comes out, and you pick up your phone, check Twitter, and try again, and you start swearing, then pick up the phone again, and that combination is not great. And I think one of the issues is that uh, there are lots of resources which are quite generic, but we are developers, right? We like to copy paste, and we like a pragmatic example. So let's see if I can share some of my ideas. And uh, First, uh, identify your tools. Now, in 50 seconds, I can already tell you, read newsletter, the quality is typically very high, so you learn a lot. And uh, if I had to pick up a tool here, I will go for Thesaurus. Sino means really help your article to flow, to be more elegant. Um, there are lots of uh, writers out there. You can learn a lot, but uh, I think you should always choose your own framework, your own style. It's your story. There's no right or wrong. You just tell it the way you want. And it's a lot uh, more authentic. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, uh, some idea for the structure of the blog, while the goal of the article, who you're writing for, some tips, and maybe some notes about the style I, li I like to use. In terms of structure, well, there are lots of examples. To be honest, I know bother. I think what's really important for me is a good introduction, but to start the article really nice, really well. And also to close with some reference. The developer likes to follow up. The article is not the end of the journey. They want to go ahead. You need to always keep in mind who you're writing for and what you want the audience to remember. So if you keep that in mind until the very end, until you review your article, they will all make sure that you don't lose the track. Now, established credentials are very important. I think your readers want to know who you are and what you've done. But I think it's more important to understand where you're coming from. Are you sharing something? Are you an expert? Are you teaching? Are you just uh, ranting? That's, that's uh, very important. And also, it's very important who you're writing for. So identify the persona. Developer likes to pragmatic example, as I said. Others like best practices, diagram, uh, different things. So that's, that's also important for, uh, for uh, where you uh, start writing. Now, in this article, for example, what I did, uh, I did a lot of snippets with Docker Compose, configuration file, and I think the developer enjoyed the migration story, but also those uh, snippets because they might solve their problems uh, in their uh, daily job. A good start, so a good title, but I argue that the subtitle is even more important. Together with the title and subtitle, you can already send a powerful message just before, even before the, art, the people just reading the article. And, uh, what happens on some framework, some platform, they don't have the subtitle feature, they just come out with something. You can use bold, you can use header. Just make sure they use that combination to give already a, a good a, a start uh, into to your readers. Too long to read? Yes, that's another tip that I, people use. I like to always put something at the very beginning of the article that I want to convince to invest you the time. You know, I'm very, you're very busy. In one sentence, I make it worthwhile, your investment. And also make a list of the keywords that you want to cover to your article. And as you write, you strike them down. So then uh, you can basically make sure that everything you want to cover, it's there and you didn't forget anything that's quite important. Visual, nobody likes to read the uh, uh, jump text. So use space, bullet points, visual, whatever you want. Make it nice, make it pretty, make it scannable. I want to scan through to see what's important. It's also easy for uh, your review. 
and using that as a nice conversational tone. It's more inclusive and more friendly. He helps uh, to understand. And also, very often that words you don't need. So trimming what you don't need, it's also a good exercise. Now, I suggest that what I do, I write from start to end without stopping, like I'm on fire. And then I invest the time in actually the editing. That's where real investment is. And finally, you got three, three lives, so you review three times, and that's it. You are ready for launch, no more effort. And then uh, your first blog, and maybe it's not exactly what you wanted, but it gets better over time, and eventually you may be able to share the story with, uh, with an audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was the last Ignite session of uh, this year's edition of J4. I want to thank you for your attendance and I hope you enjoyed yourselves. The next keynote will start in a couple of minutes in room nine. Uh, thank you again and one more applause for the speakers, please.